45 we'll take our hands as we get started this morning. I love to tell the story 145. 145. 145 we'll stand together, all four verses as we get started this morning. I love to tell the story of Jesus and his Lord 145. Use those words and be differently than what we came. 
there's one here that doesn't know you as Lord and personal Savior, help us to uh, get saved and understand the truth before it's too late. Thank you, dear Lord, again for everything you've done for us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Remain standing 481. <laughs> Tomorrow, 
all the kids are excited and the parents are excited -er. because tomorrow the kids leave for junior team camp yep. all the god's people say amen, amen. Uh, and so tomorrow at 11 o'clock so please be here uh, right around maybe just before 11 o'clock tomorrow so that the kids can get ready to go the bus will be here and i called pastor craig earlier uh, in, the, in the month and asked him i said about driving our bus he said well i'm actually bringing kids down from camp back to albuquerque yesterday he said so i can stay through the weekend and take your kids back on monday and that works out perfectly and then brian is going to take the bus up on friday afternoon to go pick them up and so looking forward to them going to camp tomorrow they leave at 11 o'clock so make sure you bring your registration forms uh, I know you can register online. If you've already done that, that's fine. But there will be the registration forms and uh, all the money that they need and all that stuff. My wife will be here uh, along with uh, our daughter and all Elizabeth. She's going to camp. So that way you can make sure everything's taken care of. So have all that ready. Have the kids here. Uh, if you need to know what to bring to camp, we still have those papers. Looking forward to the kids having a wonderful week at camp. Make sure they bring a sack lunch tomorrow because they're leaving at 11 and supper's not until 5.30. So they'll be hungry or they'll spend all their money the first day at snack shop. And I know they need to spend all their money at the snack shop. They need to spend all their money at the snack shop, but not on Monday. Let them spread out and go out the week. And so bring them a snack lunch and they'll have supper on Monday night. So looking for the kids going to camp. And hey, it's going to be a great time. Kids love Paxton Creek. It's a wonderful place to go. But let's pray most importantly, not for a good time, not just for safety. So pray that God will speak to their hearts. I know God, and I know God has big plans for this week, just some things we're going to this morning. That's going to be wonderful for the week of camp. So pray that God can speak hearts uh, this week during camp. Um, let me see you going down. Soul winning and bus calling this Saturday. Independence Day, of course, next Sunday. But we're going to have a barbecue after the evening service. The church will provide the hamburgers, hot dogs, and the buns. I do need, if you could please, text me, call me, let me know uh, if you're going to be here that night. Please, I don't, I don't want to buy 30 hot dogs and have uh, 50 people show up, because then we'll be sharing a hot dog, and that's, that's nice, but it's not real good. So uh, make sure we do that. Let me know. I know you'll be here, Mike. I know there's food. If I'm first line, you all will still be sharing hot dogs. <laughs> I don't know why we let him come, but we love him anyway. Praise God, Mike. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Please let me know. We'll be here. And we have a sign up sheet out in the foyer because, we're, as, I, as I mentioned, the church will bring the hamburgers, hot dogs, and the buns, but we need more than just that. We need tater salad, banana pudding, uh, coleslaw, chips, things like that. So if you want to sign up for something like that, again, it's next Sunday night. Please get signed up on the sheet out there so we can get that taken care of probably water down. And then we'll be done a little bit early with church. We'll eat after church. And then when it gets dark, the village is shooting off fireworks right here across the street. So we can have a front row seat for that. Uh, so please invite people. If anybody asks you, what are you doing for the 4th of July? You got big plans? Yeah, come with me. Come to, come to my home away from home. We bring you to church that night. We'd love to have you there um, here that night. Men's fasting and prayer will be on uh, September. I'm sorry, September. It'll be in September too. But on first in Ju July the 8th, next Thursday night, and the night not next Thursday, the following weekend. And then on the, the 11th of July, my brother Abel Hernandez will be preaching for us in the morning service. We also have a youth conference coming up on the 21st to 23rd here in Albuquerque, the Hour Time Youth Conference. And then another youth conference for our kids on August the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, I believe it is. So be a prayer about those things, help our kids raise money uh, toward that. Now I've got a couple things. Also be in prayer for uh, Pastor Eddie Mendoza down here at Valley Baptist in Berlin. He's fighting COVID right now. And he's uh, he's doing better, but he just he's having a hard time breathing still. And so I talked to him yesterday. Just pray for him as he continues to battle with that. And also Paul Connors, I guess, tested positive too. So pray for him as he uh, gets over that here real, real soon. Um, next week, praise Lord, we have Asia is going to get baptized next week. Because yeah. her, mom, her grandma and auntie will be here next week. So praise the Lord for that. And so invite people. So hey, next Sunday we're having a baptism as well. So come and see and find out what baptism means and what it stands for and all that. Also, I want to hand these out too. I want to give us very much time as we need this morning. But we got to get we need to get this taken care of. For the month of May, we had the the South being the North again. We have an annual contest that 
we'll keep having it until we lose. But the contest is, <laughs> we, we're, we, we were challenged by Harvest Baptist Church in Santa Fe, because their church is about the same amount of people coming. They actually have a few more uh, coming to their church. And uh, whoever brings the most visitors in the month of May, this year it was, uh, wins the prize. And we we didn't just win, we annihilated them. And that's the way it ought to be a contest. Uh, thank you for working so hard and doing that. We had the goal, 45, 45 visits in the month of May. And uh, it was right around that time, Pastor Dominic preached that message about sometimes we set our expectations a little bit too low. I thought 45 was high. But you guys brought 51 visitors. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm grateful for that. Thank you for working so hard. And in the, we had contests inside the church to see who could win. We had some bikes that were bought. The economy bought bikes for the bus kids. They didn't bring enough kids to qualify to win a bike. And there, there was a certain amount they had to do to get that. They weren't. So the next contest we have, we still have the bikes to be given away. They will be given away next time if any of our bus kids bring enough kids to qualify to win a bike. Because bringing one person bringing two people really wouldn't qualify. We wanted to work for it to earn something. Mm -hmm. We believe in earning things, not just participation. So, yeah. <laughs> so earning things. Now, the families earned these. We had I, the other contest we had for the adults was the family that brought the most would get two, because the number was 45, they would get two gift cards of $45 each. And these you can use at Longhorn Steakhouse, <laughs> or any other junky place that you want to go. Um, but you could go Longhorn, Olive Garden, Cheddar's, some of these others I'm not sure if we have here in Albuquerque, Garrett, because we're pretty good ones there. So this one is for, there's two of them for $45. That's a total of $95. And uh, that, here's the neat thing about this was, this belongs to the Pops family. Woo! I guess you qualify as a member of the Pops family. <laughs> Congratulations, I'm not sure how much you did work your butt. Your family did a good job, so they can not eat. And they need, by the way, that won't cover the whole family to go out to eat, but that will help to get them out to eat. Here's the neat thing. Two years ago, that's how the Potts family came, was because of the north versus south. And so it works that way, proof that remains. So thankful uh, for that. With that in mind, let me tell you this way. Um, the dies years ago, led a, the, he, he led you, Lord, is that correct? Brother Di led Brother Ergus the Lord years ago. And by him, he got him to church. So this is that. And now they're part of our church. And then, Brother Ergus lives just down the street with the Potts family. And they got the Potts family in the church. But they, they were already saved and all that. They got them in the church. That's how it works, by the way. People reaching people. And then the second place family, it must be something about that road up there in El Cedo. The second place family is the Joe Ergus. Uh, him and his kids were getting like a 45 dollars gift card. So I need one of them to come up for it. I'm going to get my pocket. Come on once, come on twice. Here comes another Joe. He's a great boy for that.
Dear Lord, we thank you, God, for the wonderful day you've given us. Thank you for the, the rock that we are able to stand on, the firm foundation of Christ. Thank you for all those that were able to make it today and those that do give an offering. Pray that you bless them, Lord God, what we do give above and beyond, Lord. I pray that you be with the preacher today as well and those that go to camp that they be touched. And if anyone doesn't know you as Savior, that they'd make it sure, Lord God, this week. Just thank you once again for the day and the blessed rest of the service we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, church. Okay, can you turn with me to Acts 9, 1 through 29? I'm calling this the road to change. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogue, that if he found any of this way whether they were men or women he might bring them bound into Jerusalem and as he journeyed he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him Saul Saul why persecute thou me and he said why who art thou Lord and the Lord said I am Jesus whom thou persecutest it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told what must do. In verse 6 we see here, sometimes we have to trust God, even though we may not know what to do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, neither did he eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. 
And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire into the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen a vision, a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. So we see here in verse 12 and 15, so we, uh, God is already working on Saul's behalf, orchestrating godly people into his life. Right. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to the saints of Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will shew him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou comest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from heaven, uh, fell from his eyes that it had been scaled, and he had received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. So immediately after Saul receives the Holy Ghost and proclaims and is baptized, he goes and starts proclaiming Jesus as the Son of God. We're going to see this coming up. And when he received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples, which were Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is this not that he that destroyed them which were called on his name in Jerusalem and came hither for the intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dealt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that, many days were fulfilled that the Jews took counsel to kill him. So we see now that going out and speaking truth can put you in danger, but we cannot compromise. Uh, but their laying wait was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come into Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed that not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto him how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out of Jerusalem. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. In Matthew twenty-two fourteen, it says, Many are called, but few are chosen. Look at King David. He was written off immediately by his dad, Jesse. But he was a chosen vessel because of his heart. That one person we write off could be the one the Lord has been waiting for. We are a chosen generation. Sometimes we're going to make mistakes in life. Look at King David with Bathsheba. He had an affair, went out and had his best friend killed. Did that stop his calling? No, it elevated him. Look at Peter and his denial of Christ three times. Did that stop his calling? No, it elevated him. I'm telling you, Satan is here to steal, kill, and destroy, and he is a liar. He's going to try to do anything to sway you from your calling and your purpose. I'm telling you, we cannot compromise. We must stand on truth and our values. Thank you, guys. Well, the Pulpix, we're going to watch a video now about Apache Creek. And so I thought the guy here was ready. I thought I was just going to get But it's technology, so it's a mess. So, should we sing a song? Should I sing to you while we're waiting? No. No. Okay, we'll just wait. Let me get somebody to get the lights, too, please. Jesus.
have an amazing week. And I'm not joking, if you've been here before, this will be the best week of your entire summer. Some, it's been the best week of their entire life. It's our honest desire that every single one of you, number one, is that you come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The second thing is that you learn how to daily walk with God. The secret to a successful Christian life is dying daily. That's just a sneak peek of what the kids get to enjoy uh, this week at camp. Help me, help me grab that here. Oh, Ronnie's got good. Thank you. So, kids, this week at camp, it's the, the best thing about camp is the preaching. It's a good time to play, man. And then you saw them there. Yeah, I'll put it in order. Preaching, cowboy cookouts. You went. And then skits and gun games and things like that. But looking forward to kids going to camp this week. Be in prayer for them because they'll be, uh, it's a great environment. They get up in the morning and have devotions and then they get to uh, uh, have breakfast and they get out and get out and clean their rooms and then they have church and then a break and then church and then lunch and then activities and free time and then supper and then church and they get to go and have a little bit of free time and they have devo devotions before they go to bed so they'll be getting a lot of bible this week pray that it works in their hearts pray that it's not just a fun week at camp but underneath that much bible preaching and teaching something good will happen Let's pray that way. Let's go ahead and stand. We're going to sing one more song before the preacher comes uh, this morning. Number 250, 250. He keeps me singing all five verses, 250. 250, singing with a smile, all five verses, 250. There's within my heart a Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 
sing, you can be just be seated and we'll let the kids be dismissed to junior church now and obviously the workers as well. So that all the kids be going to junior church. Thank God for that. I can introduce to you now. I guess most people here probably wouldn't know him. Pastor Craig Lang been there at Apache Creek since forever. I know he grew up there and uh, wasn't necessarily born there, but probably feels like it. I remember we grew up at Apache Creek. Uh, I was there as just a kid. And then there was this other little kid running around, always in the way, just kind of being a pest. Five years younger than me. I, I know he, he looks older than me, but he's, he's actually five years younger uh, than I am. And over the years, we developed a, a good relationship and good friends now. Thank for Pastor Craig and his, uh, his hand upon the camp. Of course, his dad, Pastor Dean Lane, started the camp, uh, I think, 1975 and been going strong ever since and thankful for his dad but it, it's also thankful pastor craig now he's kind of taken as pastor lang is slowing down a little bit now uh, when he was i think 14 i think has first heart attack and he's since then they he should his doctor told him one time a few years ago he said reverend dean you're the reason you won't die so you won't sit still long enough to die and i believe that because pastor Lang, you can't keep up i don't care what your age is you still can't keep up with pastor Lang, dean lang Never ride in a car with him, I know that for sure. But uh, I'm thankful for him and his testimony, but also for Pastor Craig. It's easy, it's hard sometimes to follow uh, when your dad has done something great for God and step in and kind of take and run with the, what God's laid upon your heart. And Brother Craig has done that so well. He's been in charge of the camp for many years now, the co-pastor there at Temple Baptist Church in Reserve. I'm so thankful for God's t uh, hand upon his life and what they're doing there at the camp. Pray for him as he heads up the camp this next week. Pray for him now as he preaches uh, for our 11 o'clock hour. Brother Craig, come preach. Amen. What a blessing it is to be here. Uh, so thankful for the opportunity to come. And uh, Brother Matt talked about the, picking up the kids. I thought, what a perfect opportunity. We're coming uh, Saturday, and then we could stay the weekend and go. Of course, uh, and it's amazing, God gave me a sermon after that that I really feel that he, he wants me to preach this morning and has been working on my heart about it. Uh, but I'll tell you, it was hard for me because I, I thought, started thinking of all the work that has to get done this weekend and everything. And I thought, you know, maybe I'll just drive home, make sure everything gets done, drive back, then drive back. And then I thought, you know what? I'm just going to uh, trust the Lord. I just want to come up and, and uh, be here. I, even Saturday, I was thinking, nope, I got it. I, we're just going to do this. And uh, I tell you, this has been a great year. Uh, devil has been fighting. His, he knows his time is short. And uh, I tell you something, everyone seems like they're going through it uh, right now. It's so good to see all the young kids in the church, the bus ministry. I believe that there, there's such a need for bus ministries. It breaks my heart going all these places, and they, they, they're not outreaching people. We have a van ministry where we are because we use vans. Uh, but uh, churches need bus kids. They really do. Uh, and we've raised up a lot of people in our church from our bus ministries yeah. for those kids that have come, the, the kids that are part of that. And I believe that churches need that. Yeah. I really do, even though they're, they're noisy and, and have to learn a lot of stuff. But what a blessing it is yeah. to, see them grow up, to see that. And it's empty. I have, I've had two churches contact me this year uh, about oh, seeing if I'd be interested in maybe going out. And they said, we, we have nothing but old people. We need young people. We need someone that's good with kids. And, uh, but none of them are willing to start bus ministries. They're not willing to go out and pick them up. And that's an important, yeah. important thing. And so, so thankful for that. So thankful for the, the heart of your pastor and the heart of the people here to reach the people in your community. It's such a needful thing. Uh, my beautiful wife, Miss Debbie here, is with me today, my son Nathaniel and my son James in the back. And uh, it's a great honor to be here. I get every once in a while to watch your services on the internet when our internet works up there. It doesn't work very well. And so I actually didn't know y'all were in a new building. So I, I've been out of the loop for a while. So I thought, boy, I need to, I need to get out and, and travel more. So I've been watching the services and the pulpit's the same from the other church. And also I didn't really uh, notice it. It definitely seemed like the platform was a lot bigger. But uh, anyways, God is good. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here. So let's go ahead and open up our Bibles and get in the Word of God. We're going to be looking at Genesis. We'll be turning to Genesis chapter 11. God had put two different 
uh, stories on my heart from the from the Old Testament and uh, just praying about it, praying about it. And finally, God just said, this is how I want you to preach it. We're just going to mix it together, put them all together. They go in order. This is what we're going to do. I'm so thankful uh, that we have a Bible. I'm so thankful that we have God's Word. I'm so thankful that uh, I love the Old Testament. You really see the mind of God in the Old Testament. The way God thinks, the way God deals with leaders, the way God deals with people. In the New Testament, you see the heart of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful that we have this and that we live in a country where it's free, where we can. It's the most printed book in the world and probably, sadly, one of the least read. Uh, I encourage you, if you've never read your Bible all the way through, Read it all the way through. There, I, I've read it over through 20 times, and there's still things that God constantly brings to my attention. Just little things here and there that are just so beautiful, such nuggets. That before you pray, ask God to give you something as you read that will speak to your heart, a nugget for the day, something you can meditate upon. And uh, you can even get little 3 by 5 cards and call them your medication or meditation cards. <laughs> Kind of like taking your daily meds. But anyways, put that, write it down and have that with you. Memorize it, meditate upon it, and uh, you, you'll be amazed on how God will use that in your life. Well, this morning we're going to be looking at Terah. We're going to be starting off with Terah and going through his family. Does anyone here know who Terah is? That's right, Abraham's father. We're going to be looking at him today in, in Genesis 11. We'll be starting with verse 26. It says, And Terah lived 70 years, and begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abraham, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in the Ur, in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. And the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren, and had, she had no child. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, and, son, and his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees, to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran, and dwelt there. Dearly Father, I just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord, to preach this morning. Father God, I thank you for your goodness, for your mercy. I pray, Father, you give me the words you have me to preach, Lord, not to thank you. Lord, just uh, let my mind be clear, my words be clear. Lord, as you speak to me, help me to speak to your people, Father. I thank you for your love and kindness and goodness. In Jesus' name. Amen. I constantly remind my church, I, I'm the camp director of Apache Creek Devonese Ranch and pastor of Temple Baptist Church, but I remind them, and it's always going to be reminded, that these are real people. Right. Abraham was a real person. Tara was a real person. These people had emotions, and as you read your Bible, you'll see that. I've always been uh, blessed with, I can put myself in other people's shoes oftentimes, so when people are talking, sometimes I'm too kind because I think you I've probably done the same knuckleheaded thing you did. And uh, so talking to them about it, how we can work. But seeing here the lives of people. We see the life of Terah, Abram's father. We see that he had three sons. I don't know if this is the exact birth order. Normally it is the birth order given. But uh, Nahor married one of Haran's daughters. I'm not sure. I don't know back then. But anyways. But we see that Terah was Abram's father. We see that... His son Haran passed away, which was Lot's father. Uh, I always wondered why Abram put up with Lot so much. Yeah. Why he didn't jerk a knot in his tail. Well, you see, because he loved his, his, his father that had died. Yeah. That was his brother, possibly his younger brother, if this is in the birth order, his younger brother. And so he had that compassion. He had that mercy for him. He had that uh, wanting to show kindness and to help him through his grief and healing that that can go on for a lifetime. And we see that Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, in verse 31, and his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, and his son, and Abram's wife, and they went with them from Ur the Chaldees. Now, this is something I hadn't noticed before in reading my Bible, but, but God spoke to my heart with just this next 
uh, section here, it says to go into the land of Canaan. And they came into Haran and dwelt there. Now, I don't want to take liberty that's not there and not given, but we see that Terah was going to the land of Canaan. Uh, if, if I don't have a... I wish I could do PowerPoint something. Maybe I should just learn to do it. But anyways, uh, you have Ur of the Chaldees here, which later became Babylon, which is Iraq today. And then you have the land of Haran here, but then you have Canaan, which is where Israel is today. Uh, it would be like... God telling someone or someone planning to move to Socorro from Albuquerque and they make it to Las Lunas. They might make it to Berlin, but they're not where they're supposed to be. And we see here that Terah, for whatever reason, it was obvious in his heart he had a purpose whether God told him to or not. The Bible doesn't clearly say, so I don't say that, but it says he was going to the land of Canaan. It says that that is where he was going. But you know where he made it to? Outside of Ur of the Chaldees. He made it outside. It wasn't the land of Haran at that time. He later named it for his son that had passed away. Because, And we see here, and I don't want to take too much liberty, but uh, I, I know with Terah, the, probably the emotional hurt uh, of, of his son dying, and no one should ever have to bury a child. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you've been. I don't, no one should have to bury a child. And here we see that Terah had the loss of his son. We see his emotions that he was going to the land of Ur of the Chaldees. He was probably broken emotionally because his focus is still on Haran, his son. His focus is on this. And he made it just outside of Ur of the Chaldees. Not very far. Literally, like Albuquerque, Las Lunas. He made it out into the plains. And I don't know if it was because he was emotionally drained and all that. But he decided to settle. God. He was literally going to the land of Canaan. That is where he was going. That is where his plans were. But he never quite made it there. He made it just outside of it into a land that he named after his son, Haran. We see here in verse 32, and it says, And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from the, thy kindred, and from thy father's house, into a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. Yeah. And in thee shall the, all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarah his wife, and the, Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls and they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth into the land of Canaan. And in the land of Canaan they came. You see, they weren't in the land of Canaan. They were in the land of Haran. But Terah had planned to go to the land of Canaan. And God is merciful. God probably saw a man that was broken, that had lost his son and all that. And I don't know if God called Terah. But I know as soon as Terah's life ended, immediately God called his son. He said, you know what? I, maybe God had a plan for Terah. Maybe today, if he would have gone all the way, we'd be singing Father Terah today. I don't know. Instead of Father Abraham, which is not to be rude, but one of the most annoying songs here. <laughs> I hate when we sing it, but... Uh, oh goodness, it's a good, I mean, it's a, kids like it, so that's good. But anyways, uh, man, I, okay, got to get focused. So anyways, but Terah did not go, but we see as soon as his life had ended that God called Abram. And then what did Abram do? He got up and left. He got up immediately, gathered up everything. Now he had had a life there for years and years and had cattle and had uh, servants and had tents and had everything. He had a spread. He had to gather all that up and go because God had told him to. And I, I thought God spoke to my heart and said, what if Terah had made it all the way to Canaan? What if he had gone to where God, obviously he, that was his plan. I can't say God called him there because I believe God's being merciful and I'm not saying, well, Tara, I told you to go. You didn't go. So now it's your son. I think he was being merciful because he saw a broken man, the broken heart that that his whole focus uh, was was still getting over the death of Haran. We see that 
He didn't make it there. But can you imagine how greater it would be if he had made it there? How more of, a, a, of an advantage that Abraham would have had and not had to have packed everything up and left. And it reminded me, and God spoke to my heart, that sometimes God calls us to things and we will go just far enough for comfort. We'll say, okay, God, I'm not, no longer in Ur of the Chaldees. I'm not in where you want me to be, but I'm going to be right here. There are many people I, I have traveled to, many, many churches. Me and my wife and my family were missionaries to Apache Creek, so we go and raise mission support, preach at churches. And it seems like not every other church, but every four churches or so, I'll have someone come up to me. And they're always so generous. They always slip me some money or something like that, but they're, they're very generous and they say, you know, God called me to the mission field. Or God called me to be a preacher. But life happened. I said, you know, first, I, I need some money. I need, a, I need something for my kids. And then they had kids. And then their kids were in school and sports. And they said, well, you know, when they get older, then we'll go. Because I don't want to take little kids to a foreign country. I don't want to. And then all that. And when my kids are in school, once they graduate, then we'll go. But life happens. Life happens. And, and they'll often say, God called me. And I know that God called me clearly, but I never went. Now, there's some of the best mission supporters there are because their heart's on the mission field. Their heart is still there where God has called them, but they never reached their full potential. They never went all the way. And I want to tell you something uh, here. It's never too late here. Abram, God waited until Terah passed away and God gave him the opportunities, I imagine, until the end. But when his time was gone, then he called his son. I'm so thankful that my father was called to start the Apache Creek Deaf and Youth Range. It would, it, it'd be an almost impossible. Nothing's impossible with God, but to do it today, to have everything that was built, to, to do that property a day would be in the millions. Uh, it would be crazy. I'm so thankful that he answered that call, that he paved that way, that he was there. And it, it, to me, it's sad because we have Tara, such a great person that raised great children, that raised Abram. I mean, he, he learned from his father how to worship God. Obviously, Terah was a man of God. And, and God had plans for him, many plans. And I believe God is gracious with and not scolding him here or anything. It just simply says he was going to the land of Canaan. And then he settled in Haran. So I decided to look it up on a map. And I thought, they are not even close. They're not close at all. I, I saw, and then that's when God started speaking to my heart about it. But we see that Abram ended up in that land. And then God had him there. And God told him, listen, Abram, all this land is going to be yours. Get up and walk in. He walked across and he started going and seeing everything. And then he settled in this area. And he took Lot with him. Abram had a good heart. We see that from his life. And he took his nephew with him. He felt like he needed that father figure that he didn't have. So Abram took him and he was kind of a little bit of a thorn in his flesh uh, after that. But his heart was in the right place. And we see that Abram and Lot were out there. I'm going to be looking at the, the life of Lot here next because God kind of had two sermons put together for me. And that's that's going to work good. So that's good. Uh, but we see that Abram and Lot were there. We know the story of the herdsmen started fighting over wells. They started fighting over things. And so Abram took them out and says, all right, Lot, here's all the land. I'm going to give you first choice. You can take this area, the well-watered plains, and, and here this area is drier and, and, and different, and, and you can kind of choose what you want. Well, Lot wasn't necessarily looking at the fields. He wasn't necessarily looking at the pasture land, but he was looking at the cities of Stockton. The Bible says right away after they chose which ways they would go that he pitched his tent towards Sodom and Gomorrah. He pitched his tent so he could see the fires and the campfires at night and the activities going on in the city. Probably close enough where he could start hearing the music at night. And he could start seeing things. And his heart started going towards that. Now it's amazing because the Bible continuously calls Lot a righteous man. Which I'm so thankful my righteousness is not in me, but Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful that my righteousness is not in my good works. Because 
We'll see here in a little bit, Lot did not necessarily have a whole lot of good works. His own son-in-laws called him a hypocrite and a liar, pretty much. And we're going to look at that. Let's turn over to, uh, we'll look at verse 18. Verse 18 is uh, where the Bible says, And the, the Lord and two other angels came and talked to Abram. This is where uh, God told Sarah she'd be having a child. And, and she laughed because she, she was older. She could no longer have children physically. And then God did a miracle. Uh, we see that this is where uh, they were communing with him. Verse 20 is something that caught my attention. Where it says, and the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because their sin is very grievous. There, all throughout the Bible, you will see when people cried out, God heard. God is a loving father. And when you cry out, your loving father, it's going to get his attention. So many times in our lives, I, I thought I had cried out unto God until I spent three hours one night crying out to God. Until he got a hold of me and broke me and just had me weeping and crying and broke and asking God. And then starting to see God's hand upon my life in, a, in an, an amazing way, just guiding and leading and all those things. But there's so many passages and, and someday I'll put a sermon together about when they cry out about all the pa There's a lot of passages when they cried out and God said, because of the cry, because of these people cry. He says the cry of the innocent blood. Of the children. America's in trouble. But we see that Abraham. Uh, God told Abraham. I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And he decided to tell him. Uh, it says here in the Lord. Said, Shall I hide from Abram. The thing which I do. And he says no I'm not. I'm going to let him know. And then immediately. Abram. Started. We know the story. He started saying Lord please don't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He knew Lot. And he says, there's 50 righteous. And then he thought about it and thought, I know my nephew. If there's 40 righteous, if there's 30 righteous, if there's 10 righteous. And then uh, he thought, let's see, I've got Abraham. I got Lot, his wife. He's got four daughters, two son-in-laws. That's six. Man, surely 10. There'll be 10 righteous. And we see that the Lord ended up staying and talking with Abram and the two angels went to the city. We see that the two angels, as they, they entered into the city, that the wickedness of the people were so great. Lot saw them far, from afar off and knew exactly who they were. In verse chapter 19, verse 1, it says, And there came two angels to Sodom and even at even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. He recognized them as angels. He recognized them as men of God. Yeah. I imagine it's probably the way they were dressed, the way they looked, but he recognized it right away. He had them come into their house, and the men of the city were so wicked, so wicked, that they were trying to get in to do horrible things to these men. This was a wicked, wicked city. Yeah. Lot went in there, not only, but Lot was like the mayor of the city. He was sitting in the gates. He was one of the rulers of this city, which if you're a ruler of this city, then there has to be a lot of things you're agreeing with. There wasn't a whole lot he was trying to change. We need good men and politicians. We need good ladies in poli politics and all that, but not where they're letting it consume them and they get blinded by that. And we know that they, the angels end up blinding them. I don't know if they were physically blinded, uh, where they, you know, everything was black or they just couldn't find the door. Maybe they were just going around like, I knew there was a door here somewhere. My, my, my mind works way too much imagination, so I think of all kinds of different things. But they told Lot. In verse uh, 12, it says, And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters? And whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them. Out of this place, for we will destroy this place because of the cry of them that is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons in law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. 
but he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons in law. That's a sad statement right there. He seemed as one that mocked. They said, you believe in God? I've never seen it. You believe in God? Aren't you more about money? Aren't you more about politics? Aren't you more about all these things? And now you want to preach God to us? If you want to leave, leave. And we'll be here tomorrow. And we'll, we'll see you when you get back. But Lot knew. Because Lot had seen the power of God. Lot had seen it with his grandfather, Terah. Lot had seen it with Abram. Lot had seen these things and he knew he was backslidden in that. And it says, And when the morning arose and the angels hasted, Lot saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest they, thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold of his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. Now, Lot didn't like leaving the city. Yeah. He really didn't. He was a city boy. He was not a country guy. Uh, he did not like, I, I don't imagine he really liked tending the sheep. I don't imagine he really liked any of that. He was in the city and liked staying there. And verse 17, it says, And when it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, they're already out of the city, that he said, uh, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee. Neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest thou be consumed. He told Lot, Listen, Lot, you need to get out of this area. That fire's about to come down. It's going to get bad. You need to go to the mountains. And Lot did not like this idea. I thought this was kind of funny when I was going through my morning devotions and reading it again. And it says, And Lot said unto him, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight. Thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast shown unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Lot was kind of scared of the mountains. He was kind of scared of what was going on out there. He's thinking, man, there, there, there's not a whole lot out there. There's not someone to deliver food. There's not someone to, to do all these things that he was used to in Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, he knew that Sodom and Gomorrah was wicked. He knew that it was bad. And yet his heart was still there. His heart was still in the pleasures of the world. His heart was in that. I know all, all people have different jobs. All people, God has different pur purposes and plans, but I believe all men should have a desire to work hard. I think if you don't have a desire to work hard, you need to get one. You need to get one. Sitting home all day playing video games ain't going to cut it. And sadly, I'm not talking to the teenagers. I'm talking to people my age. Sitting at home all day playing video games ain't going to cut it. Listen, it's okay to work hard. Everyone should have a, a yard or something. If you live in an apartment, go Getting some dirt, it's good for the soul. It's good for you, you know? You should have calluses from, uh, at least from the keyboard or something. I don't know what kind of job you have, but, but something. Learn to get out and do it. But anyways, Lot was afraid of the mountains. And then he started, uh, he learned from Abram, I guess. He started pleading with the Lord. He said in verse 20, Behold, now this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for, that, for the which thou hast spoken. This is the city of Zoar. Z-O-A-R. Here Lot was saying, Okay, I know Sodom and Gomorrah is wicked, but there's just a little town over here. There's just a little city. There's just a little thing with some little pleasures. This is where I want to go. He said, Is it not little? Is it not? Please, don't, I don't want to go to the mountains. I can't survive. There's no way. And it's amazing that, that God in His infinite mercy took Lot and his family out. Took Lot, that his wife, as he was going. Her heart was so that he looked back. And, and if you notice, it's, it's not by their, everything in, in the Bible. Every word is here for a reason. And it says, and my soul shall live. He, he's not talking about his flesh. Before he was saying, his excuse was, I'm going to die if I go to the mountains. I'm a city boy. But what does he say here? He says, so my soul shall live. And, and he said, so I can have pleasure. So I, I used to think that fasting was to get your flesh in control. 
And I started studying the word everything. It talks, it, it, it so much says getting your soul in check because your soul controls your flesh. This is just, you know, DNA and all that stuff put together uh, miraculously and amazing, but it's our soul that controls it. It's our soul that has us do bad things. It's our soul that gives into the flesh. So when we fast, it's really getting our soul in its subjection to get everything else in its subjection. And he said that my soul shall live so I can have these pleasures. Listen, there's times that God's going to be merciful to you. Maybe God's pulled you out of some things that, that you thought were going to be hopeless and helpless. And God says, listen, I've got a plan for you. I've got something better. I'm going to pull you out of this because I love you. Because you're my child. Number one, if you're saved, God has had great mercy on you. That you got to hear the gospel. That you got to understand and that you listen to the Holy Spirit. And accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. But so many times we say, God, I, I want to give my life to you, but what about this little area that's so tiny? Lot said, is it not a small city? Is it not just something small? Maybe God's been doing a work in your life and, and you're saying, God, I surrender all, but you're saying, but not this area. It's just so tiny. It's just something special to me. It, it, it gives my soul some life. It brings pleasure to me. Do I have to get up all my pleasures? Do I have to give up everything? And, and we can look at it and we can see from hindsight that, Lot, what were you thinking? And yet so many times in our life we say, God, I, I want your power. I want your holiness. I want your righteousness. But I don't want to give it all up. Just as Lot's grandpa said, God, I'm going to Canaan, but not all the way. Not all the way. Imagine if he had gone all the way. The effect it could have had on Lot. Lot may never have been in Sodom. Lot may never, because uh, Terah would have been there years before. Sodom and Gomorrah may not have even existed. It could have been part of Terah's territory and not what it became. And I don't know that, so don't. No, the Bible doesn't, I just have a really overactive imagination. And uh, when I read the Bible, it's like uh, playing a movie in my head because it's so, so I, I, anyways. But we see with Lot that he didn't want to give up everything. He did not want to give up everything that he said, is it not little? Listen, every one of us has something in our lives, even me, that I say, God, what about this? Can't I keep this? It, it pleases my soul. This makes me happy. We, we finally had to get rid of our TV just because it was driving me nuts. It's a weakness of mine. I love History Channel. I love Discovery Channel. I love those. Th I can stay up all hours of the night watching documentaries, which is probably not good because they're on my phone too, but our internet's horrible out there, so it's a blessing. But God spoke to me. It's a time waster. It's a time waster. And by the way, if you say you don't have time to pray, you don't have time for your Bible, you don't have time for your family, you don't have time to do things with your kids, you don't have time to do things with your husband or wife, why don't you pull out your phone and go to that section that says how much, I don't know, my phone does it every Sunday. It tells me how many, how many hours a day I've been on it. You know, your time's been up so much or down to, y'all's phones do that too? I don't know. I just thought it was God convicting me. <laughs> it happens on Sunday, which is the beginning of the week. I'm like, yes, Lord, I'll put this down. And uh, anyways, if you don't have time, look at You know the average person spends six to ten hours? Average. That's, if you all look at your phone, it's probably six to ten hours a day. A day that you're on that thing. That should be convicting right there. But listen, Tara did not go all the way. What his plans were. And I don't know if God told him to go. But I know it was his plans. The Bible says he was going to Canaan. I know he did not end up there. That would be like today. Like I, I mentioned. Someone say I'm going to Socorro. And then you're like. What are you doing living in Las Lunas? Yeah. Or why are you in Berlin? That's not Socorro. Well it's close enough. At least I'm not in Albuquerque. Yeah. You know. Of course I wouldn't want to be in Socorro either. But <laughs> that's just me. <laughs> oh man. But we see with Lot. Then he started partying for pleasure still. Right. For just that little. He wasn't willing to go to the mountain. God called him and told him, go to the mountains. 
And I imagine it was just for a time, for his safety, for his learning, for his goodness, that God says, go to the mountains. And, and he says, but I'm going to die in the mountains. There's no way. I don't even know how to start a fire without hiring somebody. And that, he didn't really say that. I can just imagine. Uh, but once, once judgment started falling, listen, once judgment fell upon Sodom, upon Gomorrah, once his wife looked back, because that's where her heart and soul was, and Lot's, Lot's soul was in the city. He said, so my soul can have pleasure. Once that judgment happened, once his wife turned into a pillar of salt, which she literally did, once that city was absolutely destroyed, absolutely destroyed. Listen, you can play around with sin. You can play around with things and you can say it doesn't matter. But listen, there is a day of judgment coming. There is a day when everything that you said is just a little thing. It's not a big thing. It's just these little things that I watch or just this text message to this person. It's okay. It's all these little things. Listen, there is a day of judgment coming. And when that day of judgment comes, you may be saying right before it, God, I know you're convicting me because guess what? Conviction comes before judgment. And you may say, okay, I'll give up this, but I want to keep these. I want to keep this. And then all of a sudden the judgment comes. When judgment came. In verse 22, it says, haste thee, escape hither. God told him, you want to go to Zor? Go. Haste thee, escape thither. For I cannot do anything till thou come hither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zor. And by the way, why God didn't do anything when Lot was there. Because God says he was righteous. And Abram, and there's another passage that says because Abram prayed for Lot. Mm -hmm. And because of Abram, listen, some of y'all got people praying for you. Yeah. You're praying for other people. God hears them. God is having great mercy. God is going to do something. Don't ever give up praying. Don't ever give up seeking him. And don't ever give up listening. And it says, it says here, the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. So sunrise. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the city and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. And Abram got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld Lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham. God remembered his covenants. And God remembered Abraham's prayers for his nephew, for his brother's son, Lot. For he feared. Let's see. I skipped over somewhere. He remembered Abraham in verse 29 and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. And when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him. For he feared to dwell in Zoar and dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. Here before, just the day before, the day before, Lot was saying, God, just let me have this little city of Zoar. Lord, let me so my soul can be satisfied. So my soul can find pleasure. I, I'm not a country person. I'm a city boy. Pretty didn't say that, but my mind's saying that because that's how he's acting. He's acting like a city boy. But in, no offense to y'all. y'all no. This is Las Lunas, probably a lot of country. But anyways, listen, he got there. And when he saw the judgment of God, once he saw the harsh judgment of God, and it's a righteous judgment because there is people crying out. There was people crying out saying, God, that we need you. This is unfair. This is unrighteous. Even when the world cries out, God hears them. When, when innocent babies cry out, God hears them. The judgment rained down upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And I can only imagine what it would like to have been there that day. He could see it from the land of Zoar, from the city of Zoar. It, he could see the smoke rising. Every once in a while, people in Berlin are burning ditches or something. I'm driving through and I can see it 
out there and all that. He lost his appetite for the city. He lost his appetite for it. Listen, some of y'all have an appetite for things that God says. Let go. Let go. Move on. This is not what I have for you. Listen, you're my child and I love you. And we'll plead and say, God, can I just have this? And we'll be like, okay, I can have this. And God's like, you're not going to want that pretty soon. It's going to put a sour taste in your mouth. Pretty soon, once you see the cost of sin, once you see the destructiveness of sin, you're going to want to back away. Lot could have stayed in Zoar, but you know what he did? He said, this place is wicked too. And he took off to the mountains where God originally told him to go. Now, I don't know if God would have kept him there the whole time. I think he would have kept him there for safety, had him learn a lesson. But that's where he ended up staying. And his end is, is sad. He started drinking. He, he got into PTSD and all. I mean, I don't want to be rude, but like, that's a real thing. People get traumatized. He was traumatized. Everything he knew and everything he loved and his soul loved, which was not righteous, it got destroyed. And then his daughters thought nothing was left. And so they ended up getting pregnant by their father. And that started the Moabite tribe. And that started the Ammonite tribe. These were daughters that someday could have married possibly Isaac. I don't know because age and all that, but they were, they, these were people that, that were God's chosen people. That went off the path. That got into sin. And then got broken by the sin. And I do want to give some encouragement. As I, as I was going through this again. The other day I was thinking about it. The first child was born was a Moabite. Or started the land. His name was Moab. Started the Moabites. Which fought the Israelites for a long time. But God had mercy. These are all the co everyone out there in the Middle East is cousins of some. You know how family is. They like to fight. But it reminded me of the mercy of God because God saw a young lady that probably came from a rough home because when she met her mother-in-law, Naomi and her husband and her sons, even though the husband passed away and the sons passed away, Ruth said, Naomi, I, I like what you got. I don't want to go back to that. I, I like, I see how kind you are. I see the mercy that you have. I see your goodness. I'm not going back to that. Wherever you go, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And Ruth was a Moabite. And God had great mercy. Even these two daughters-in-law had sinned. God has come in again and said, come on. He grabbed some cousins and brought them back. And we see that Ruth became the grandmother of Jesse and then David. And in David, we see the line of Jesus Christ. We see God's mercy through that. And I just want to tell you something. If God is calling you somewhere today, if God is calling you to the mission field, if God is calling you to be a preacher, if God is calling you to be a Sunday school teacher or to help in the bus ministry, or if God's calling you to witness to someone, you need to do it. Don't settle for, oh, God's putting this person on my heart. I need to witness to him. I need to, oh, I'll go tell Pastor Wooten. He'll go witness to him. Have you ever done something like that? I know I did as a kid. I know as a child, God told me, witness to these friends. And I thought, well, I'll invite them to church. I don't want to. I, I might say the wrong thing. Or I'll go tell someone else, hey, you need to go witness to these people. When God was telling me to witness. Listen, God's calling us to different things. We need to fully commit to whatever it is. Because the consequences later can be great. They can be devastating. We don't know. But what we do know is when there's an Abram that fully commits to God, he changes their life. He changes everything about them. Listen, if God's calling you to something, commit to it. If you've got sin you're holding on and you're, you're arguing with God and you're saying, God, I, I, let me, I'll let this go, but let me keep this. I'll let this go. I'll let this bad relationship go. But this one's not so bad. These friends are bad. This isn't so bad. These things are really bad. I know it's bad. But this isn't so bad. It's just a little. But someday you'll lose your taste for all of it. All of it when judgment comes. 
God is merciful. God is good. We need to fully commit to Him. When God calls us to do something, when God calls us to let go of something, when God calls us out of something, we need to give it our absolute all. We're going to have a time of invitation. I'd like for everyone to stand. Thank you, Ms. Judy. Maybe this morning God has called you. And you know God has called you. He's called you to witness. He's called you to teach. Maybe He's called you to the mission field. Maybe He's called you to do more. But I know He's called all of us to witness. What are you doing? Are you only going so far when God's told you to clearly witness? Do you just hand Him a track and say that's good enough? When God's told you to witness. Do you allow things in your life and say, but God, it's so little. God, it's so little. Listen, if you're not saved today, you need to get saved. Being a good person won't get you anywhere. Doing good things won't get you anywhere. But having Jesus Christ, Lot was not doing the best of things. He was not in the best of place, but he was righteous because of God. If you're not saved today, I urge you to come forward and to trust Christ. Maybe there's some here today and they say, you say, Pastor Craig, I'm not saved. I don't. I feel it in my heart. I need to give my heart to God, but I'm not. Would you raise your hand and I'll pray for you? Maybe there's some here that in your heart you know what God has called you to. I don't know, but you know it's on your mind right now. That person you need to be witnessing to is on your mind right now. That family member that that you're too afraid to talk to. That friend that you don't want to lose. Maybe it's God's put a mission field on your heart. Maybe He's put a neighborhood on your heart to go take your vehicle to and pick someone up. Maybe it's a city to start a church. This morning, please come. Please, truly surrender all. Don't just go out of the land. And I know there may be some here that are broken. But God wants to use you. God wants to use those that are hurting to do great and mighty things. I can only imagine what would have happened if Tara made it all the way to Canaan. How about you today, child of God? Are you doing what God would have you to do? Or you do like you mentioned with Tara, he just he started down a journey only got a certain way. Can't tell you how many Christians do the same thing. Where they, yeah, I know God wants me to do this, but I'm willing to go this far. Go all the way for Christ. Just do whatever He wants you to do. Be one of those religious fanatics they talk about. It, it's better serving God. He mentioned too about Lot getting into sin and People get into sin. Who knows what's going to go on? I heard a preacher say it this way one time. You can choose the sin, but you can't choose the consequences. Listen, sin will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you long you want to stay. It will cost you more than you want to pay. Listen, when God calls you, if God's called you to get rid of something, go ahead and get rid of that something. Don't let your soul be hung up like Lot and his wife. Man, she, she looked back. I really believe the same thing, that Lot, his heart was still hung on to a lot of that stuff that he saw in Sodom and Gomorrah. That stuff ain't worth it. Leave that stuff behind. Go on and serve God. Go all the way with Christ. He wants you to get there. You go there. Don't just get up and go a little bit. Go all the way. Has God put someone on your heart that you need to be witnessing to? Give the gospel to? Lost loved one? Lost co-worker? Maybe a saved loved one or a saved co-worker that needs to be back in church. That needs to be back. Maybe just let God break your heart for lost for loved ones. Whether they're lost, especially they're lost, but they're saved but running from God. And be an encouragement to them. Remember what Neil Moody said. Somebody one time when they were walking down the road, they Mr. Moody, look at that drunk guy there in the gutter. Mr. Moody's response was great. He said, But by the grace of God, there go I. We're nobody special. We're just, thank God we're in church this morning. Let's encourage others to get back in and serve God. Thank you for that, Brother Craig. We'll, we'll be dismissed here now in just a, just a moment. Praise God for the rain. You can't leave now because it's raining. We're in the, we don't know what to do when it rains in New Mexico. So.
Time for round two, I guess, right? We just stay and have church again? Because how many of you brought an umbrella to church this morning? That's exactly what I thought. We don't know what to do when it rains. Nobody brought an umbrella? Uh, that's okay. And it's, it, the, it's muddy in the parking lot, so you might as well just stay here. We'll just have church again. Take a break and go again. No, I'm just kidding. Thank you for that, Brother Craig. Don't forget, church tonight, we'll have choir practice at 515. Choir, we need you here tonight so we can get ready for next Sunday. Uh, and then, of course, church at 6 o'clock. Looking forward to what God has for us tonight. Studying on faith tonight out of Hebrews chapter number 11. So let's go ahead and we'll sing song. Be dismissed. And also, for those that are bringing your kids for camp tomorrow, don't forget, tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Please don't show up at 1 o'clock when you get on the bus. Uh, please be here by 11 with a sack lunch. All the registration papers and the monies and things like that. And for those that aren't going to camp, seriously be in prayer for our young people at camp this week and see what God can do in their hearts. Number number 92, Touring That City. We'll sing that on the way out this afternoon, number 92. Page 92, we'll sing both verses on the way out. Many times I have wondered about the sights of that city and all that my eyes shall be I will see all the wonders when I enter that city, then forever to be safe in his fold. dismissed but on the way out make sure you sign up on the sheet to bring something for next sunday night please don't forget that you are dismissed